did Muay Thai, did everything I can get my hands on. And then when I found Capoeira, my heart just beat different, you know. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 728, with today's guest, Professora Marina Lima. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I founded Whistlekick because I wanted to support traditional martial arts and traditional martial artists, probably people like you. And if you want to know more about what we are doing to support the industry and the people, go to whistlekick.com. It's our online home. It's the place to find all the things that we're working on because it's a long list. It's also the place you find our store because, yeah, working on this stuff requires some money. And those of you that pick stuff up, it helps us move forward. If you use the code PODCAST15, you're going to get everything for 15% less. So head on over there, grab yourself a shirt or a hat or protective gear or any of the other cool stuff that we've got going. The show, Martial Arts Radio, gets its own website. And you can probably guess what it is. If you're new, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We keep it easy. You'll see new episodes of this show twice a week. We never hide any of the old episodes behind a paywall because the entire purpose of what we do, the goal of the show and Whistlekick overall, It's all under the heading of connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists worldwide. If you want to support the work that we do, there are lots of ways you can help out. You can make a purchase, you could share an episode, or join our Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. It's the place to go for that. You can support us monthly with as little as $2. And if you spend $5, you get bonus audio. 10 gets you video content. And it goes up from there. And everything but that $2 tier, you get bonus merch that we send out. It's just, we'll throw throw that your way too. Like we work really hard to make sure that the people who contribute to the Patreon get more than they ever imagined. If you want the whole list, all the things that you can do to help us out from the free to the paid, type in whistlekick.com slash family. We put that hurdle in front of you because we want to make sure that it's only the people who really love what we do that get the benefits of that page. Today's episode, as I'm sure you could guess, involves stories. Stories of not only coming to America, but discovering where one fits in. Fits in in a country, fits in with other people, fits in within the martial arts. And I don't think I can say anything more without giving things away, so I'm not going to do that. I loved this episode. And I loved how things unfolded. I hope you do too. Lorena, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here. Now, when when I look through your bio, you, if if someone was to take my bio and just like swap out the things for different things that were kind of similar, it would be your bio, right? Like you have this passion for movement and um, cross-training that very few, admittedly a growing group, but a, still a very small minority of martial artists have. You know, and I love that. And I know we're going to get into some cool stuff. So I'm pumped that we get to go there. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited too. I think that there's just so much knowledge. There's so much to learn. Right. Mm -hmm. And everything is just so interesting. And I respect all kinds of modalities. So I feel like cross training just gives me a better view of every game. Um, I cross train a lot because at first I was kind of like finding myself. I didn't know what I wanted to do, especially Mm -hmm. specifically. I didn't really like being violent. So violence was hard for me. I was very um, shy. I was an introvert. I was many things that I'm not today, right? Due to all this training for uh, so many years. So when I got into it, I was like, okay, I just want to learn how to punch. I want to learn how to kick. And then you can look at, at um, any martial art in, in different levels as you get older in it. You, you can look at it from, you know, how to receive impact. That's something people don't think, think about, but that takes you a long time to learn. How to receive impact, how to take like heavy energy, someone really going at you and you not, you know, losing your mind, but understanding how to think through these situations, like emotional handling and there's physical handling and there's different aspects to everything. And, um, I'm a lover 
devout lover of capoeira and capoeira is very vast so it, it, it too many things into one it's a, cult, a whole culture in itself and um throughout my training of other things nowadays and i've, I've been training capoeira since 1998 now <laughs> which is amazing to me that i can even say say that like i i trained capoeira for that many years it's, it's exciting um and it's also it's good and it's bad because i see everyone who started who's not here anymore right who's not here anymore a lot of people don't make it through the funnel right the tiny little funnel you start like way up there and then i would be bigger. one of those i started capoeira in 1998 i made about two yeah. years yeah that's amazing that's amazing so that's what i'm saying it's like it's a funnel and capoeira is vast. There's too many. Capoeira doesn't really have rules on how you can use your movement. Pretty much there it is. And, and that's a difficult thing for the capoeira themselves to understand. You've been in the game for that long. You can see how capoeira is not. It's not like jujitsu. Jujitsu, you're going to see a little bit of a variation in style, but jujitsu is still jujitsu. Boxing, you're going to see a variation in style, but boxing is still boxing. Uh, but capoeira will still be capoeira and it will look completely different um, depending where you go. And the more I traveled, the more I saw that it was different and different. And then now, later in the game, I'm starting to understand how to join things, right? How, how jiu-jitsu fits into capoeira, mm. capoeira fits into jiu-jitsu, and how my slips that I use when I train boxing are good for everything, right? For movement, for arm drags, for takedowns. When when you when you talk about you brought up those three arts, boxing. And when you say jujitsu, you you're referring to BJJ specifically. Uh, yes, I am okay. a first degree black belt in the art of Brazilian jujitsu as well. Um, I started tra training jujitsu a little bit after I started training capoeira. So I started capoeira at fourteen. I started with karate at first at twelve, mm -hmm. and then. Um, did kickboxing, did Muay Thai, did everything I can get my hands on. Yeah. And then when I found Capoeira, my heart just beat different. You know, it just. Ooh, I like it, the way you said that. Yeah. Because amongst Capoeiristas, we say that, you know, Capoeira, it, it picks you, it chooses you. You don't, you don't pick Capoeira. It, it picks you. And then mm. it's, it's your method and you fall in love with it. And, and, um, and like I said, it's so vast. You, you keep, um, the more you learn, the more you notice you have so much to learn. And um, when Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu came into my life, it's because I was getting, I was extremely bullied. And if the person back then, like the little kid in me could never imagine the woman I am today. Mm. And I remember, I always remember being that little kid, being defenseless, being helpless not knowing what to do because I was getting beat up on the daily. I was, mm. I lived in, um, I lived in upstate New York and everyone thinks upstate New York is great, but it's not, it was so ghetto. Depends on the area. <laughs> yeah. It was like, I'm not going to name names, hole. but I've spent time up there. I'm not that far from upstate New York. Depends on the area. Yeah. So it's, um, upstate New York was, was different for me. Mm. We moved to the States when I was, well, I was born in Brazil, so I am Brazilian, Brazilian American. I was born in Brazil, and uh, we're going way back. <laughs> I was born in Brazil in um, next to the Amazon, so I'm from Belém do Pará, which is different for most Brazilians in the U.S., mm -hmm. which is why I look Hispanic and everyone will speak Spanish to me, but I'm Brazilian. <laughs> and um, I, I've I've heard that that is uh, a like the worst thing you can do to a brazilian is to speak spanish it just it's because it's so frustrating because it, it, very few of us learn portuguese i can still count to 10 that's all i've got left for my time in capoeira uh but just if i was to rattle off some spanish at you like i've heard it just it, it's like nails on a chalkboard to someone from brazil see but that's where i'm different okay. right um, i'm fluent in a couple of different languages and i spent time living in puerto rico so i got to emerge myself into culture a little more sure. so i'm fluent in spanish and i'll speak spanish back because before i would get that feeling yeah i would but spanish was the closest language i had when i came to the states we went mm. to miami it was easier to learn um spanish than it was to learn english 
yeah, so I started learning Spanish. Um, and from there, and, and Miami was interesting too, you know, Miami is so warm, so full of culture. And coming from Brazil, what, at the tender age of a couple of days to turn to 11, mm. you know, I came during the World Cup of 94. Yes. Why did you move? Why did your family move? Um, we were very, very poor. We were very poor. My life in Brazil, the, the time I spent there was also difficult. We lived in the gold mine for like a year or two, mm. <laughs> digging up gold. And my mother was always working and she was never home. I have brothers. So I had to grow up very early. And if you see a child in Brazil and a child in the U.S., um, the, the child in the U.S. is innocent longer, mm. right? You see a child in Brazil, they understand a different view of the world, the view of the breadwinner. They work hard. They yeah. have to contribute. They have to. It's just different. Um, the world is more malicious, for a lack of another word, because people don't have a way. So they have to watch out, watch over your shoulder, make sure no one tries to steal your money when you're going to the market. It's, it's different. Um, so... When I came to the States, it was it was freedom in a way because we had a lot we didn't have. We were so, so poor that sometimes it was like, okay, rice and beans, this is what you have. At some time, at some at some point, my my um my grandparents hunted, so they brought back meat, and then we had a lot of meat for a while, and then you know, things were tough and things are always tough. That's all I remember when we were a child. You, you hinted at something at the very, very beginning, and it was an interesting word choice. And I don't remember exactly what it was, but it gave me the sense that you grew up around violence. So was, was there a violence component to your time in Brazil as well? Yes, there was always a violent component. Yeah. It's, um, growing up, you see a lot of um, abuse. Mm -hmm. It's normal, you know man beating up women it's normal to see that and it's not normal <laughs> but you grow up a lot around that um people in my family and it's seeing that happen when you're little kind of puts it into perspective like well if i don't do the right things maybe i'll get beat up mm -hmm. which happens you know over there whenever you did something wrong back in the day you just deserved a really good spanking so and then my mother, who didn't know what to do, was a child with a child. In in when we grow up, I just I got beat a lot in the beginning because it took her a while. And she's she's an amazing human. I love my mom. I know she did what she could. I have nothing but love for her and the woman she she helped me become. But when you're going through that, you you don't know how how to handle it. You don't know what's right. You don't know what's wrong, and you end up becoming what you're not. And that's normal nowadays for people to become what they're not and for people to be okay with that, to be what they're not. You go through life being what you're not, being expectations, being what you're meant to be for the family. And in Brazil, when this is your reality, it's much more in your face that you have no other choice but to help. So coming to the States, having younger brothers, man, I didn't have time for sports because sports were right after school, mm -hmm. but I had time for martial arts because martial arts training is always at night, always at night. So there was time for martial arts. So I was like, okay, I get to practice something. I get to learn how to protect myself. I didn't know how to punch. My skills were kicking a soccer ball really hard. Mm. <laughs> I played ball. I've always been an athlete, um, but hitting someone is just, something I couldn't picture myself doing back then, you know, like um, being violent. So you end up being violent because your environment will ask you for it. Not just in Brazil, but then moving to Miami, I started getting into fights. And then moving to New York, I got into more fights. And then I was finally, why well, I need to learn how to fight because this is crazy. I can't be living my life this way. And then when you're young, your mind 
is so easily manipulated by the good things and by the bad things. And then you start thinking, oh, I'm not meant to be here. I'm so depressed. I, I can't go out of my house. I can't. It came to a point where I used to go to night school because I got beat up so much during the day that I had to go to night school. Mm. And then finally, my parents were like, we're done. And then we moved to Massachusetts from New York. How old were you? Then, um, 14. Okay. Yeah, 14. So that's, and then, when, that's when Cabrera started, was in Massachusetts. Yes. In New York, I ended up training karate. So I learned, you know, basic punching, um, kicking. I enjoyed it very much. I understood what it was like to hit hard for the first time. And I think that was very pivoting, a pivoting moment for me as a person because I felt empowered because I didn't know that I could kick that hard or punch that hard, you know? Um, and I remember the teacher going, you know, don't kick anyone like this out in the street, please. I was like, really? Why? <laughs> He's like, no, you're doing very good, but don't kick anyone like this in the street. I was like, okay. Um, and I used it, of course, when I had to protect myself. And my nature is one of, of a caretaker. Um, but at that point, I was already reactive. I was like, anyone said anything, I was like, you want to fight now or later? You know, because you get conditioned and you're like, if I show fear first, that's it. I'm done. Mm. I'm done. These kids are never going to leave me alone. If I show a sign of fear, they will chase me to the ends of the earth. I am good. Um, and then when we moved to Massachusetts, it was different. I remember my very first day of school, my very first day of school. And for me, in the school that I was, there were a lot of cultural differences, right? Half of the room was black and Puerto Rican. The other half was white. The side in the corner were all the people that came from like Latin America. So I was very, I know I didn't belong because I was the only Brazilian. So it's like, where do I sit? Mm. If I sit here, I got in trouble. If I sit here, I got in trouble. So it, where, where are different. messages for you? No, that was in New York, but I oh, came okay. to Massachusetts afterwards. No, that was New York. It's called Ellenville. Ellenville. I, I don't know where that is. Okay, it is like 30 minutes from Middletown. Okay. You'll find Middletown on the map, 30 minutes. So real upstate, literally a hole in the mountains. And there was so much violence, you know, mm. and, and a lot of my friends that stayed there, they just they didn't make it, you know. And when you think about people not making it, you being that young, it's, it's weird. It's odd. It's like something that's not meant to happen. So when we, when we moved to Massachusetts, my first day of school, I remember, and again, this is from my ignorant eyes at the time, from the reality I lived in to the new reality, I saw a very dark-skinned man speaking. He said these words exactly. He went like, oh my God, today is wicked cool. And I was like, what did he just say? And again, this is a cultural difference. I was just like, and I saw a very light skinned blonde girl going, and excuse my language, but I'm not even going to say it because it, it, it makes me spike when I say it. But she was like, yo, dog, and used the N word. So I saw, mm. oh, that's what I'm saying. Those are because some can, interesting contrasts. And, and this, you said this was like your first day? So you, you don't even know what to think. You're just, what is happening? Is, is this the upside down world? Yes. and then, But then a huge um, Brazilian community, which was also hard. I didn't know how to deal with Brazilian. I just came from learning how to be American. You know, like the only reason why I don't have an accent is because I was working really hard to sound American for a long time, being in front of the mirror, speaking to myself, making sure my bathroom sounded like a TH and not like an F, you know, bathroom. I have to go to the bathroom, miss, you know? And then you come and you're like, you're not Brazilian enough. You're like, what? What happened? I thought I just went through this backwards over there. Yeah. So then you come here and then I didn't know that, um, People were so culturally different in Brazil because the places I traveled in Brazil were all in the north. 
and people aren't that different. But then you you go from the more north and you start going to like São Paulo, Rio, um, and then you go to the south. It's like different countries that they speak Portuguese, but it's so different. People forget. I mean, you know, but listeners may forget how big Brazil is. It is not a small country. It's massive. It's massive. It's huge. And there's so many cultural differences Mm -hmm. within Brazil. So much is different. And the people in Framingham are mainly from, because I moved to Framingham, people in Framingham are mainly um, from um, Minas Gerais, which is a completely different dialect of Portuguese than I have. So we were, here we go again. So here we right, go right. again. It's okay. You keep going. But then I found Capoeira. And then I was like, wow, this is so cool. You know, this is, has dance. This has music. And I, I was doing a little bit of ballroom. I've always liked to dance. I've always liked everything. So I figured I'll just keep myself active in the time I can. Because every other time I was being a caretaker to my brother. So I figured I'd enjoy the little bit of time I have and always explore. And then when I found Capoeira, it was like, everything was there right Mm -hmm. and then in our capoeira school a couple of years later when i saw jujitsu i was like that's a really tiny woman handling a very big man (laughs) it was amazing for me to see and she was just doing a presentation but this presentation that she did showing techniques and showing what is it she did a couple of sweeps and arm bars triangles basic jujitsu stuff from the self-defense um, situations, like, you know, chokeholds from the ground and situations that I had been in, you know what I mean? Through mm. feeling violence from other people. And I was like, I didn't know when that, I didn't know what to do when that happened to me. I had no idea what to do. Cause what are you going to do? I was, I was training karate. Are you really, my punch is not going to be that strong in close range. And maybe it's not going to be that strong for some people who are really strong period, you know? maybe it won't be as effective because you're like going power against power unless you're really good, really comfortable that you're at a point where you understand movement, distance, and you know how to dodge, you know how to get in and get out. Just something I did not have yet at all. <laughs> so mm. I couldn't count on it. I was like, okay, this doesn't work. But then jujitsu, I was like, oh, okay, jujitsu is so interesting. Then I started training nogi. And I was like, wow. And then my capoeira master was. Who, if, if I may ask, because capoeira at that time in Massachusetts was not big. Can I no. ask who you were training with? So I started um, in another group in Artimania Capoeira, with at the time was Nidio um, Carranca, with Mestre Boy. You know, Mestre Boy went to Ache afterwards. But okay, back in the day, name. Mestre Boy was in Jersey, Nidio Carranca was here. But then I had happened what many of us have happened in martial arts. My master up and left. Mm-hmm. He just bounced. We woke up one day with all that love for Kapuera in our hearts. And he got up and he bounced. Mm. And it was so very difficult to, to have all this love and not know what to do with it. So I had met my mastery, which is currently until today. His mastery is Ekonfomi, which Z with hunger. <laughs> That's what it translates to. Nice. nice. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know his name, but please continue. Yeah, so I am, my Meshi and I are the representatives for our group in Brazil, which is, mm. a, I'm from a very large group. It's FICAG, the, the letters F-I-C-A-G, mm. and it stands for Fundação Internacional Capoeira Artes da Gerais, because it also comes from um, Minas Gerais, from Belo Horizonte, my mm-hmm. group coincidentally comes from Valerie Bunch. So I met my master at my bachizado. There was a small event. Do you remember the Dragon Lair in Framingham? Still there? They had a bunch of events. We're going back far enough. No. Okay, they're still there. So the Dragon Lair used to have tons of fighting events at Club Lido's. They had some small competitions too. And they're still up. They're still standing in Framingham. Cool. Um, And that's where a lot of us in jiu-jitsu started at the time. Hmm. Um. We started jiu-jitsu there because it was the only real jiu-jitsu place, but they didn't do gi. They only did no gi. Yeah, so you have some guys in the area like Soneca, who's also a longtime black belt, Tahina, who's also a longtime black belt champion. All of them came, a lot of us from many different teams that are in Massachusetts came from the Dragon Lair at the time. 
Um, so I would go to the Dragon Lair, train there, and then I would go in my ma- my master would be a student at the Dragon Lair like me, right? And then together we'd go to Capoeira and I train Capoeira with him. And then because he trained everything else, he did Muay Thai and then he started teaching more Jiu-Jitsu and then he got into Gi. So I just did everything because I was there to do everything. Um, but I, at this point in my life, I was also... I was an extremely reactive human and being with other people was extremely hard for me. And that's, that's a fact. Um, I didn't know how my, I didn't know how, well, people easily impacted me and I didn't know how I impacted people. So I didn't know I was very, um, you know, how it takes us time. I think sometimes for us to understand the external or how people perceive us. And I was always, I knew how to speak, how my mother spoke to me, and it was always in a very rude tone. Mm-hmm. I knew how to protect myself by staying away, which means I didn't know how to socialize. Um, and then when people, you know, how in Capoeira Hall does, sometimes things get a little spicy, right? <laughs> things get spicy, you know. Yeah, but for I me, do. if things got spicy, I was already like, okay, it's on, let's go. Because that's the mindset that I was in. It's, it's protection is fight mode fight, all of a sudden fight, that headbutt's not a fake all of a sudden that it, you're you're making contact no no yeah. they had to hit me first i was very i was very precise about that because i remember I right still but that's like what i mean people. they 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 slip you know that that um i'm forgetting all my term names but a okay. kick you know connects it's an accident you're like all right let's go yeah no because capoeira it really is it's because Capoeira is in the subtleties, right? It's the difference be- between jiu-jitsu and capoeira. And capoeira, we are very, it takes us time, but we learn how to maneuver energy and flow, right? And then you're always kind of looking for that energy and flow together, but you are trying to catch each other. It's just that there's so many, so much timing and exits. And as you get good, the, the window of where you are able to actually get someone, it's like this tiny as they right. get better. Because they have good protection, they understand how to use the movement to their advantage, and how to stay in the flow of the rhythm. Because I think that's what takes longest, right, for you to understand. But then Capoeira doesn't have rules, meaning like I can kick fast, I can kick slow. The slow kick doesn't necessarily mean that it's a futile kick. Maybe the slow kick is a trap, mm. or maybe the slow. Yes, there's lots of unsaid rules in Capoeira, and. Because I had been through so many of these live experiences, and back in the day I started, it was still the 90s. So, you know, everybody was getting in in Capoeira. It was, we had the street holders in New York every Saturday. Have you ever been to those? I I, I haven't seen them in New York, but I've seen them in other places. Yeah, New York had. And and I've been tempted to jump in. I mean, not now, but. You know, I, I I bumped into one of them in Maine, of all places, and it was during the time that I was training Capoeira, and I was like, I kind of want to jump in, but I don't know this group because I don't know how they're going to play. I don't know how they're going to react to a stranger. So ah. I just watched. Yeah, I, I I had just enough Capoeira education to understand some of these things you're talking about. That these, you know, when, when you talked about earlier boxing and you're talking about BJJ there's the competitive aspect. There's the rule set, which guides what people do and how they do. Maybe not um, completely, but it does give some, some guidance to how things are going to go. The rules of boxing might be slightly different depending on where you go, but they're more or less the same. The rules of, of BJJ competition are more or less the same when you go places, but without being competition driven, Capoeira can be so dramatically different. And what I notice, and I'm, I'm curious if you feel the same, it's the personality of the instructor, of the mestre, that seems to make the biggest impact on the culture of that school. If the instructor's a big old jerk, mm-hmm. people tend to play in a much more aggressive way. I think that is a reality of any art, right? The student, unfortunately, because the student puts the master in such a high pedestal, we end up just, you know, repeating 
the same cycle back and forth. Um, and capoeira is very held into its traditions, but everyone argues about the tradition that is best because there is evolu an evolution of capoeira in different different aspects. Um, like we have groups that clearly are impacting other groups in their growth. Like uh, I come from a more martial arts style of capoeira, but I know how to play the other games because it, it is necessary to know how to play all the games. But you can see clearly in my jingo what style I come from. It's so like no, when you say more of a martial arts style, would the would the other end of that spectrum be more the dance elements? Is that kind of the dichotomy? So the reason why I stay particularly a uh, martial arts style, I will still be dancing my bum off in Capoeira because it needs that rhythm. Yeah. So the reason why I stay martial arts style is I'm always worried about uh, the malicious part of the game. Okay. Meaning like everything I do, I worry about the um, consequence the action and reaction, which is something that we do as martial artists across the board, right? So we always make sure that our base is one where we're not going to be leaving ourselves open. I do all of that within my jinga and my movement. I always anticipate, as we do in other arts, anticipate what could go wrong, right? Mm -hmm. The difference between my capoeira and other capoeiras, meaning is someone who's from another style, maybe they'll prioritize a body language that has lower arms, more exposed face, and they trust their partners enough to do a shkiva where their face is going to be exposed mm. right in there. Where in my house or, you know, in my traditions, if you do that, in capoeira, we talk a lot about malicia in capoeira, the malicious aspect of capoeira. Mm. Capoeira is supposed to, it looks like a dance on purpose, so it's meant to make you comfortable. Capoeira is meant to make you comfortable. It's meant to make you free. It's meant to make you um, get into my flow. Kind of like, you know, the old, the snake dancing around, tricking you until the bite comes. We talk about right, that a lot right. in Capoeira, um, that we cook the energy and we make things happen. Just like in BJJ, you know, um, I'm small. I can't go head to toe against the guy who's bigger than me, right? But we put a kimono in there, things change because mm. I have a lot of tools because I understand my grips, the action, the reaction, right? But I can't make him do what I want. Not exactly, right? I can't push him and he won't go. But if I pull him, he will go. So mm -hmm. um, Capoeira teaches you a lot of this getting in and out. And you're supposed to be thinking about this 24-7. But I come from, there's Capoeira, there's many different styles of Capoeira, right? Many different styles. Sure. Um, but Capoeira that was created by Mestre Bimba, which is the capoeira regional, the capoeira that comes with more of the fighting aspect, um, the capoeira that's a bit more athletic and dynamic. Angola is also dangerous and it has the same abuse, but it is slower, yeah. right? However, um, I think Angola is very dangerous <laughs> because the little things you can't see. So I think what's happening now, this is a lot of capoeiristas are losing the aspect of the martial arts of capoeira, meaning like attentive to action and consequence, action and reaction, understanding that it is a martial art and we are meant to have a stance that's going to be hiding our vital parts, all of these things that are supposed to be primal to the art, because that's what it was created for. It's an art. Right. It's an art of liberation. Capoeira was was created in a in a time of need of liberation, created by the Afro-Brazilian. So the African slaves that were taken to Brazil that were going through struggle that had no liberty and capoeira was created to look like a dance because when the ufeito or the slave owner would be like oh they're just doing their tradition but no they were fighting they were practicing a lot of the movements are called animal moves because they were getting ready to rebel to liberate so I feel like losing the martial arts aspect of capoeira is almost it's an injustice in my point of view but what I mean about the other side is the other side is just they're more worried about uh, maybe the aesthetic part of capoeira or like what it does for your body and how it looks visually. You know what I mean? Like you see some people, they they will kick very wide and they will do very pretty things, but then there's no attention. But the person who's good at capoeira truly, 
they'll be doing a backflip and in midair, they're still looking at you. You know, in midair, they're still watching you because they understand they just did an act, action. There's going to be a reaction somewhere, you know, and um, the, the consequence is always there. And in the Capoeira world, as a woman, I'm going to say it right now, and the Capoeiristas who are listening will truly agree. <laughs> As a woman in the cup with a world, having a game like mine is very different. It's not very usual, right? Mm. Because capoeira is vast. Capoeira has takedowns, <laughs> lots of takedowns, <laughs> lots of takedowns, lots of um, action, reaction, ins and outs, um, lots of uh, you know maneuvering of energy you can make it's just like boxing and any other art you're not going to go and just punch in the face if you want to punch in the face you're gonna punch in the body until the face is liberated <laughs> and you're like oh the face is there now i'm going to go to the face but and and that's see that's something that training martial arts cross training in martial arts it's just a different view you know um one thing that I don't like to get into, even though I cross train into other arts, I keep capoeira, capoeira. I keep capoeira, capoeira. Is that difficult? Um, I think for me, no. For a lot of people, it is. For me, it's, it's not difficult because I exercise it often. Mm -hmm. I work on my body language diligently. I'm always working on my body language and I'm always trying to make sure that there's a softness but it's open to other things but what's happening right now in a lot of social media which it stinks that's all people care about sometimes is being famous right it's sad but which, sometimes it's you know we all know gets you almost nothing i know what's the point <laughs> but they're doing it you know they'll be doing like oh capoeira is good for the body but then the girls wearing gloves or the guys wearing gloves and they're punching pads and then they're doing kids you see that video right I, i've they're seen a number pads. of things that, that purport to be capoeira that you know I, I i fully admit you know i know virtually nothing i can i can step into a hoda and barely function at this point oh, years stop, later stop stop but I know enough to know why are you wearing fingerless gloves? That's <laughs> what there's no point to that, right? Like, yeah, it's it's like I said, it's different views of the game, you know what mm. I mean? Like, um, I can go in Capoeira, like right now, I can go into Capoeira, and anywhere that I am in that Honda will give me what I want from Capoeira because I'm there to take the energy. Obviously, I want to mm. play. But there's ways, there's ways you maneuver the game so the game is down to your level. So you're sure. like, okay, I don't, I really don't want to brawl because I'm not feeling good today. I don't want to get in there and do all that. So if your body language, which I just said, I work on body language diligently because there's a difference between me doing like just me doing a jinga with my upper body and things are relaxed right ah hey let's play okay oh you you see people they want to play because there's there's it's loose movement you can tell that there's no ill but if i start going yeah. you know like there's a lot that's going on you know and that took me a long time to understand and the fact that i understand it is a victory in itself <laughs> But it's um, understanding how to keep the energy where you want it, understanding that how how you get in there makes a difference. So, like, let's say if I was in your shoes, I'd be going to who does the hoda belong to? Because uh, this is how I learned. And I was very fortunate. And I'm going to say fortunate or because not everyone gets this anymore. How you get to a place? How do you go somewhere? Mm. How do you go somewhere where you're not known? You're the only person. How do you not mess up what's going on there? But still play because you want to play so bad, right? So go, usually I would go, you know, meet the owner of the hall, the, contribute with some energy, say hello to the people who look like them. They matter. You can always tell, right? Oh, yeah. The people who matter. You can always tell. Hi, how are you? Da, da, da. And be like, can I play? Okay. And you breathe and you smile. 
<laughs> and that took me forever to learn how to do. Mm-hmm. You smile. You smile. That's like a word it's called playing. It's not called fighting. Because your face can change so much, right? And in the beginning when I played, I always looked angry because that's how I felt, right? So now I put a smile in your face and you let the energy be slow. Boom. You don't have to play lots of capoeira. Or you you do, but lots of capoeira can be looked at differently. Lots of capoeira can be moving and really feeling what is what it's like to be in your body during that moment. Because the hoda is like, wow, right? People, it's energy. People are smiling. People are clapping. People are playing. The instruments are there. And and if you feel that for capoeira that you want to play, you're like, oh, that's amazing. I'm going to go play. It's, we call it that the, the beating ball, it calls you. Capoeira calls you to play. It invites you for a dance, right? And then how you enjoy that dance can be so much. Um, it's your own experience, right? I've seen people who, yeah, I've seen people who are so much older. They're like um, in their 70s and they're playing capoeira and they will have amazing games and it won't be visually like, wow, they did a backflip, but you can tell that they understand the game. They're cutting off movements by just moving a particular way. They're smiling. They're enjoying themselves. Like, that's what I want. This this is my goal for what I do is being in the game until, mm. until my time is over, right? <laughs> yes, until my time is over. Being in the game until my time is over, however I can contribute. And... Right now, at first, I wanted to just be good. So I got into the Hada and I was good and I got into a lot of fights and I got known because you're this is what Capoeira was about back then, mm-hmm. right? But what Capoeira really needs to be about, which is what it's, it's turning into, especially in the States. Look, you, you have a Brazilian telling you this right now. Brazilian, okay? I've been to Brazil to train Capoeira. I train um, online with groups in Brazil all the time. And I speak to a lot of people. And the capoeira is growing so well professionally in the States. People are doing it well in the States. They're doing Mm -hmm. a family environment. They're hitting communities. They're giving people the power of community, which right now, it's like the most needed thing. For sure. Right? COVID was hard, right? It was. It's still hard. (laughs) Very true. Yeah, it's still hard. And a lot of people are very scared. And a lot of people have lost touch with themselves. And um, throughout this whole process of everything happening, I was like, I want people to stay in the arts. I'm, like I said, I, I've been through a lot of things, but at this moment in my life, at this exact moment, I'm on the other side of a lot of struggle um, because my my husband and I were apart throughout my pregnancy and a couple of years, and we just moved back in together. He was in another country, and that's how you know Bernadette, mm. right? Bernadette, me and my husband. By the way, I'm going to say this here. And if she hears this after, it will be amazing for me. Bernadette is the woman, the idol I needed in my life. Mm. And we how, did, how did you meet her? Tell, tell us more about how you met her. Um, she's my husband's friend. She's a, she's a black belt friend, so Gracie. And my um, husband had a gym in... Manchester, New Hampshire. So I was in Manchester, New Hampshire. We were Team Link, New Hampshire back then, right? We were part of Team Link. Um, And Bernadette would come to train with us all the time. And I was, you know, uh, blue belt when I met her and I was competing a lot and I was so in shape. And And you thought you were, you thought you were hot stuff. And then you rolled with Bernadette. Is that what happened? (laughs) Because you would not be the first person who said that to me about the first time they rolled with Bernadette. They're like, I thought I was pretty good. And then I rolled with Bernadette. And I was like, I guess I'm not. It's like, you're fine. You're fine. You did great. You did great, darling. It's okay. You did great. She's incredible. And then we go again. She is. She is. You know, and for me, I'm, I'm saying this as a female martial artist. And I've been in the game. Like when I met her, I was already in it for a while. It is so difficult to have someone to look up to. That's going to mm. be that close. You can have people who are far away now with social media, you know, about everybody, right? 
but to have someone that close, someone I can talk to. And I was um, not just that, I was very angry still. I was very angry. Um, and she's like, she used to tell me I was very closed up. But when I saw her, I would talk a little more. She would always get a little more out of me. I was like, huh, <laughs> kind of scary, but kind of cool. And um, she loves my husband. They're great friends. And she came to train with me many times. I trained with her um, through my purple belt days, got my brown belt. Like we would meet each other often. We're friends. And, but she was close to me in a very important moment um, of my life. I had visited, I had gone to Seattle, Washington to teach a Capoeira seminar Mm -hmm. for a women's Capoeira seminar, which is, I'm always passionate about helping more women stay in the game because I think this is what I'm here for is to do it, empower others to do it with me. And that's what I want. I don't want to be only. I want to have a crew. (laughs) That's what I'm about. I know and it's weird saying that, but it's about time. Mm -hmm. I want to have a crew. And when I came back, my husband was supposed to pick me at the airport and he wasn't home. And then I went to the house and he wasn't around. Mind you, we had our, our wedding was already booked. We were going to get married. I was already an American citizen and he was caught by immigration. Yeah. And I was running the gym by myself and I was going through so much struggle, mm. so much, but, but pushing it, pushing it, you know? And no one saw me struggling but her. And the only reason why I'm not crying right now is because I saw her a couple of months back and I cried for like half an hour straight. Because she's like, no, no, let's slow down. Let's slow down. Let's talk. How are you doing? You know? And to have someone ask you how you are doing genuinely, people are like, oh, you know, your husband, because it was all his students, people who cared about him. The city, everyone was very... Everyone it was, was about impacted. their questions to you were about him. It wasn't about you and what you were struggling with. Yes, yeah, not that just their questions to me, but I was put in a place where they expected me to um, emotionally help them. Yeah. And I didn't have that. I didn't even know how to help myself. I couldn't help other people. But, you know, I kept trying and I ran the gym for a while and then finally... We, it, it didn't work out. So um, he ended up going to Brazil. And then that's where like all the traveling happened. Like I said, the other side of struggle, because I'm just back in the States now after all of that. Yeah. Um, it's been a little while. My husband just got back in December. He finally got legalized. How and long did that take? Since 2013. Okay. Okay. So yeah. nine years. Yes. But then through that, we got to go through Brazil. So I got to train in Brazil and learn about that. And then, you know, understand myself culturally too. Cause mm-hmm. like, again, it's like not American enough for the Americans, not Brazilian enough for the Brazilians. Right. And then I moved to Abu Dhabi to work in the project, the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu project there. I worked there for a couple of years and it is the only place we could be together. Um, mm-hmm. And Bernadette was just always, always like always checking on me. Always. When we got back, she made her way to come and see us like right away. Um, and just seeing how she does things and how she does things a little different, how she cares more about the human where I come from um, old school style training where you, you this is how you get good. You know, you're kicking tires and you're like, you know, pushing your body to the limits. And that's not what it's about. But that's what you think it's about in the beginning. Right. And then. Um, being this, this far in over there, I got to train with all women all the time. That was very difficult for me. Not Mm -hmm. even going to lie. I didn't even know how to deal. Because most of us, all women that were there training with all women had never trained with women before. Uh, Because it's all the black belt, black belt. So most of them are the black belts, the old school black belts, but the new generation is still coming in. So a lot of them didn't have to share the mass with other people the same. They did, but not the same. But over there, it's like, I use, I'm one team, you're another team, he's another team, but we all compete for the same company. We all compete for the UAEJJ Federation. Mm. So when we train, we all train together um, in the same mass. And then at some point, because it's a Muslim country, they would seclude the training. So women can only train with women. 
And that's hard because we're emotional. It's hard for all of us. It wasn't just me. It was all of us. All of us struggled through it. All of us didn't know how to do it. All of us messed up. That's important to say. Mm-hmm. All of us messed up, meaning like we treated each other badly. We were the human. We realized we didn't want to be. And then you evolve, right? And, and I was hoping you were going to say that because if not, I was going to ask, can you talk about that evolution and what that looked like? Um. For me, in the beginning, just training, just as a competitor, as a competitor, when you compete often, your one mindset is you have to be better than everyone else in the mats. That's how it is. When you're competing, you're in a sponsorship, and this is what you want to do, and you put your mind that you want to be the best, that's how it is. So being with other women that are good and better even than you is very difficult, not just for me, but for them. Because when I got there, I was also a brown belt. So that was difficult because brown and black were put together. And for the women um, to train with me, it was hard because then someone would always go there and be like, oh, that brown belt beat you up versus, you know, a good, well-trained purple belt will be as tough as a black belt. Mm-hmm. And that's the reality. That's the reality. They're going eight minute fights. It's crazy. They will be physically prepared, just as prepared. Um, but then a lot of us started building families. A lot of us are around like the same age. A lot of them older than me. I'm, I'll be 39 now in July. And a lot of them will be even older. So for me to be able to see them growing, right? Mm-hmm. And then you have women who were part of the Olympic teams. You know, you have like Olympians there. Um, what is it? Jose Angela Conceição, Zanza. The only... The only athlete, not man or woman, the only athlete ever in Brazil to go to the Olympics for two modalities at the same time. Mm. She went for judo and for wrestling. Mm. You know, and this is amazing. And then you have, you see them becoming moms. You see them going through the process of, you know, you're getting pregnant. You're on the mats. You can't train. Your body's not the same. They're coming back, feeling like yourself again, because. When you're an athlete and this is how you use your body and you're a woman, a pregnancy is difficult. It is a plus, a blessing, but it is difficult. You know, you don't have the same. It's not the same. It's not. You don't have the same power, the same muscular engagement. None of that. And then it, it doesn't even really have to be a woman or a man or pregnancy or postpartum. It's more about like at some point of your life, you're not going to be this amazing athlete that you were someday way back then. Um, and I think that's the, the hard truth to come to terms with when, when you're in this game for long enough and you have to go through life staying in it. You mean like you go through pregnancies, you go through marriage, you go through changes of lifestyle of work, you go through, age you go through injury Mm. which is why i deal with injury prevention specifically that's what i do for work um so i built my own company and i decided after all of that yeah so this is my company here i'm repping for myself right not not everyone's gonna see this most people are actually gonna hear it so make sure you it's okay i'm gonna describe it so i'm wearing this amazing tree it's a cool shirt lungs at the roots Mm -hmm. these are lungs and a uterus Right, there's a uterus in there. I know, I know. Because um, the reason why I have this is because I started learning breathing and I incorporated breathing into my life as I was going through the struggle. Remember, I, 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 had to, I had to come. I had to leave my husband and my life that I had in the UAE. And in 2018, the law changed. So I had to come to the States mm-hmm. and be here, pregnant. And it was difficult. And I wanted a natural birth. And through... Uh, my research, I started getting into hypnobirthing, which has breathing exercises. Um, And I did it. I did it. It was amazing. Yes. Thank you. It was also very painful, but amazing. I I can only imagine. No, but I I felt good about myself because I wanted that moment for me, for my husband, for what we were going through, for our amazing daughter. We do, I have a 14 year old and a a three year old. Mm. And Um, so I was like, okay, as I started to practice breathing and I couldn't get back, like I said, my body had just gone through that change. I couldn't be the athlete. I was coming back postpartum is very difficult. So I began investing my time into breath work, lots of breath work, lots of research, 
And then I started studying physio training, which talks about healing the body organically or just, you know, a more holistic approach to injury prevention and healing of injury. Um, and I started becoming a trainer and just getting out there and training more because I couldn't leave the house. I was pregnant with the kids. So I had to be home. This was my reality. I went from being an athlete, being, you know, a BJJ coach. I was doing tons of things there. I was doing TV work. I was doing uh, breathing. And then suddenly I had to come here. And my reality was be one of a housewife without my husband, though, because he wasn't here. So mm. a single parent, pregnant. Cool. How do you do that? I have no idea. So you figure out as you go along. Um, and this came to me as this process started happening. So the reason why I have a tree is because it reminds me of resilience because I have to care for others. And then at first I was like, oh, I only have to care for others, care for others, care for others. But then I realized that really what I needed to do was care for myself. I didn't care for myself. I couldn't care for others. It's like the airplane thing. You put your mask on first. Exactly. So I started putting my mask on and then I started really understanding myself and getting into my mind and being with myself more and, and meditation came after so many things came after, but that big mirror was right there. And then I could see all the things that I wanted to change because when you're responsible for, even if you're a teacher, you don't have to be a parent, but when you're responsible for influencing other people, that's a lot of responsibility. That's very heavy. So I started working with myself. And then as I went along, I realized that we all have seasons, which is why I have all the, the colors. We all have seasons. And um, I needed to understand that my body doesn't train the same 24-7, right? I don't train the same 24-7. Some days I train great and I ate great and I feel great. Some days I was sick and I feel horrible. Or some days I just don't feel right. Some days it's just not my day, but you know what every day is? Every day is a step towards um, the future of you staying in the art, you know, and being resilient means having consistency and means listening to your body. Because think about it nowadays, the lifestyle we have, we sit, I'm sitting with you right now. We're sitting, mm -hmm. right? And we sit most of our day. Sorry, was that my phone? Yes, it was. I, I didn't hear it, so probably. It's oh, okay. So that's perfect. <laughs> So we sit all day. Most of our kids are like in pack neck all day looking Ugh. at the phones. And then we have like very bad breathing patterns, right? Because we're always on fight or flight mode because mm -hmm. we watch the news. We feel some kind of way. We have interactions with people who don't accept us and we don't accept them. Then we feel some kind of way. We don't even take time to understand what's going on with ourselves. And half of you being good at martial arts anyway, like not even half, way more than half is knowing yourself and your capabilities, mm. right? What you can do, uh, what you, you cannot do, and the things that you don't like, and how can you change them for the better, for a positive way? So I built this company out of a dream, and the more I find myself in martial arts, and the more I understand that now, it's not like back then, now I have life experiences, right? And these life experiences can help me to help others help themselves. Um, and not a, not a lot of people do that. A lot of people do do that, but not as many as there should be, right? If you think yeah. about it, if people are just um, worried about the next news, the next exciting thing, the next TikTok video, oh, what did that start do? Oh, you know, and then I find myself being able to put my phone down, understand that. I need to be stepping on the earth every day. I need to be breathing fresh air. I need to be spending quality time with my children, the people I care about, because life is so fleeting, so short, like incredibly short. Um, and because I want to be in this for a long time, it really hurts me to see people leaving, right? And people leave because they lack support. Hmm. Um, Say more. People leave because they lack support because a lot of times it's um, like you said, it's all about the teacher and it is all about the teacher. And like I said, we end up repeating past things, which is why I'm redefining it. So I'm, I'm branching out of my programming. We'll say that 
I'm branching out of my autopilot. Um, and I'm using my masters and the masters that came before me as, as evolution. Um, so my classes are all about the person. I want to empower them so that they can feel capable enough to have an injury or to have a difficult moment and to understand that they are capable enough to get through anything, right? We are all capable enough to get through anything. So as a woman, for my end, the support, it ends up going away as you get uh, older in it. You get older, you build a family. How do you stay engaged? You're most likely not training with your teacher anymore because you're probably teaching on your own, right? Then you have your family to take care of. And then we don't have a lot of the teachers reaching out to the teachers, right? And and then that part is difficult because if you're seeing a woman come back from postpartum, it's natural. Oh, she's back. She's okay. Some women are great. Some women are not. Um, some people have postpartum depression. Some people feel insecure in that environment. Some people don't understand or can't imagine having a life of practice that their body doesn't feel the same as it used to before, not even just pregnancy, but any kind of uh, traumatic experience in your life, because you're going to have them, you're human, you know? So then you're like, oh, I injured my knee, but then it was so hard just being there that I just decided to quit. And then when I decided to go back, um, I always wanted to get in shape before I got back, but that, and that never really happened. I don't like to get beat up. And that was difficult for me. So I decided to leave, right? And that's a reality. No one likes to get beat up. No one likes it, right? But when you're a martial artist long enough, or even in, when you're in Capoeira, which is what Capoeira brings you, you bring a smile to your face, right? You understand that at some point, if you just, every experience is a learning experience. And when you leave yourself open to getting hit, it means that you did something wrong and you did something good. They're just, on their game. Go ahead. Talk about your classes. You know, I, I hinted at the top that you do a Sorry. bunch of these different things and they, they're incorporated. We've talked about BJJ. We've talked about Caboeta. We've talked about breath work, but there's a bunch of other stuff in that, in that mix that we haven't mm-hmm. talked about. Yeah. So the tree is there too, because I really believe in resilience. I believe in resilience. I believe that a tree should be flexible. Like I said, I believe it should go with the season. So the style of lifting that I do is always unconventional. I use unconventional training methods um, to continue to use the body in the ranges that should be using in mundane life. So, um, for example, yeah. So, for example, I will not load a squat unless they really know how to use that squat, right? Mm-hmm. So, I make sure they understand proper engagement. So, when they do lift weights, uh, kettlebells, and I use the kettlebell mainly in steel mm-hmm. mace. Those are my jams right there. That's my jam. And the kettlebells and the steel mace, they take the body, the shoulders, the hip joints, all the joints through different ranges while being loaded. The fact that they're unproportionate, so the way they're built is unproportionate, it tells you right away if you have any kind of imbalance. Um, The kettlebell particularly will be always pulling your weight back, forward, side to side. But the steel mace, it will completely, like right away when you touch it, and people expect the mace to be easier because it's light. Right. So you're like, oh, I can carry because when I started macing, I could carry I could already carry like a 20 kilo bell. I could press a 20 kilo bell when I started macing. Uh, American, that's 45 pounds. Oh, sorry. It's okay. It's okay. I can translate. (laughs) Yeah, I can't can't translate Portuguese, but I can translate kilos. Wait, wait. Yeah. So so I don't know. I don't know my steel mace weight in kilo. So I only know it in pounds. So when I picked up my first mace, it was a 10 pound mace. I was like 10 pounds, 45 pounds, 10 pounds, no biggie, no biggie. And the first time I touched it immediately, I can see my body going into alert because it was off balance. I couldn't mm. keep the thing straight. It's a long handle. See, I know. And you see people doing it even through the switches. It stays so straight. The muscles are so engaged. And you're like, wow, that's amazing. And by then I had, when I started unconventional training, I was coming back from pregnancy, COVID hit. I couldn't go to the gym anymore. I didn't have a sitter. What am I going to do? I need to wait lift. For the women that are listening to this, if you don't wait lift and you're getting older, 
coming back postpartum and being um, without access to a gym at all. Downstairs, we just had these really, we had four kettlebells downstairs in the basement, gathering dust, <laughs> gathering lots of dust. And then um, when I started doing kettlebell training, I was like, wow, because I did some for conditioning as an athlete for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I always had a trainer to get me ready for tournaments. And we did, you know, the basics, the swings or whatnot. And I thought I was doing them so well, so well. <laughs> and then, there, there is, there is no movement that I see done in gyms that makes me want to go over and tell people to just stop more than kettlebell swings. Yes. Oh my God. And the American ones, like they do them all the way up and then they hinge the belly forward and you're like, what's going on? So I'm, I'm going? fine with that. It's the down where they're just so rounded and you can just, you can just see it. They're using ah. one that's too heavy and it's just, they're letting it pull their back down. And I'm like, Oh, it's difficult. And I, I that's what I thought. I was like, Oh, I'm just getting into this. I'm going to get strong. Cause you know, I, I, I love being strong. Sure. I absolutely love being strong. I love being capable. Um, it's important to me for what I practice because, because I like being good at what I do, right? So I know that weightlifting needs to be a part of it. And what I was saying was as a woman, right? And like I said, I'm older now. Um, I will be 39 next month. And as we get older, we start just losing bone mass, mm. right? And the only thing that is proven to change to change the bone is weight bearing exercise. Um, and I have a lot of female clients that will be like, Oh, I want to lift with you, but I only want your legs. I don't want arms like you. And then you're like, do you know the benefits of actually weight bearing, you know, gaining some muscles good for you. So a lot of women are changing that, which is great. Um, it's amazing. And that's what I wanted for me. I just wanted to get strong, but then I was at home and I was stuck and I was looking for information because, you know, the internet is so vast, mm -hmm. so vast. And there's so much bad information out there about kettlebell training specifically because it's so popular right now. Everybody has a kettlebell at home. Everyone. No one knows how to use it. Exactly. So I started self-studying. Um, I'm really good with watching movement. I have a really good eye for movement. Mm. And I had already been perfecting that being a trainer already. I got um, a certificate from NASA when I was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And then I already started taking in clients and trying to see what style or how I wanted to train that first. I tried to do it how my trainers did it for me, you know, because that's the only reference I had. And then I realized now I remember why I hated the way my trainers did it for me because it took too much time and it was a lot of quantity quantity over quality when it's supposed to be the opposite right so there'd be like two hours at the gym i was like do they not have kids who spends two hours straight at the gym lifting people who like punishing themselves and, and, or people who yes. enjoy lifting i enjoy lifting i really do but i will not lift for two hours that's what i'm saying so but this is what people think that they need to be there for a lot they need to do a lot you can fatigue the muscle in less than an hour. It's just how you do it, right? So, and then um, I got into the certification for Living Fit, which is part of Kettlebell King, right? And I consume a lot of information, period. I love to study and I'm always reading a book. If I can't read, I'm listening to something. I'm always listening to a podcast. I'm always trying to have a different view of the world and be reminded that, um, my goal in life is to grow, is to evolve, is to get better. I don't want to be the same person I was even last week, you know? I want to be less ignorant than that person. I want to be more open-minded and I want to have um, more freedom with more information. And because there's so much information out there, what sucks is most people, they don't know how to concentrate on the positive side of information. But that's what happened for me. I was able to concentrate on the positive side of information. So I was researching breath work. I started researching kettlebells. I got my certification from um, Living Fit, the expert certification with the test in the end. I was very proud of myself. Um, and I started training people in kettlebells and that was great. But then my friends were part of Tax Fit. You heard about Tax Fit before? No. 
So tactical fitness, tax fit is a fitness system that actually helps you rejuvenate the body, stay in the game longer, pretty much cool. everything that I was already doing. Cool. And it's um called the Viking Ninja system. So I'm a Viking Ninja. That's nice. the name of my third. I know, right? It's pretty cool. It's, it's pretty, pretty fun dope. to say. Yeah. Like what are I'm a Viking Ninja. <laughs> And I got certified in that, and it was a grueling two days, two day online course. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, throughout this whole process of learning, of studying, of all these things that I was doing, I was with the baby. Um, I was a full time mom, full time breastfeeding, full time throughout that whole thing. When I had to train prior to COVID, the kids were coming with me. When COVID hit, I could only train. My consistency was once a week mm-hmm. for a while, but that's all I could get. I'm not going to take it. But for it's better than it. zero. Exactly. And when you look at a growth chart, if you like zoom out like a couple of years out, you could still see growth happening, you know? And, and I was like, no, I need to stay. I need to stay consistent. Cause if I stay consistent, things will happen because pregnancy is very difficult. And the returning process is, is difficult, you know? Um, and throughout that, I had to learn how to ask for help and I had to learn how to rely on help. And I had to relearn how to be kind to myself enough um, that I understand that I need those things, that it's okay for me to ask for help. Um, so I left my daughter with my cousin. I borrowed my friend's Capoeira gym, and he let me be there for these two days of cert. And then I, I passed the test for the Viking Ninja system. I was like, wow. And then I started playing with these two modalities um, and, and body movement, and it all just became one, right? But instead of thinking about just the exercise aspect, which is a difficult aspect, oh, exercising, weightlifting is accessible from home. Mm-hmm. Great. But then there's also the most important part of it, which it will be the neurological connections that you make, right? And it will be how you think or how hard you think, how how you think of consistency. How do you fit that in your life in a way that's really going to stick versus being something that you go really hard at and then it gets really tiring and then you really want to have nothing to do with it anymore (laughs) because it's it's annoying. Now I don't want it anymore. And and being a martial artist, it's it's like that. We always have to keep it interesting and change our view because there's always something to learn. Even when you reach the wall where you're like, I think I learned everything because you have those moments. You're like, yep, this is it. When you're younger in the arts, you're like, this is it. Now I'm an expert officially. Just give me a black belt and I'm done. <laughs> Just give me a black belt. And then um, as you get better in the art, you're like, wow, I literally know nothing. Nothing. I Yeah. I need to put my student cap back on and and get in it. So I try to work with people in a way that the main part of my work is opening up. And I do other things like sensory of the feet, sensory of the hands. I I like science. I love science. But the main thing that I do is have people open up a conversation and begin a relationship with themselves. Right. Um, I think that we're lacking in understanding ourselves enough. To know how to learn, yeah, to know how to learn, to know not just how to learn, but how to teach. Teaching is so hard um, because everything you lack is always right up there. The student will come up to you and will ask you something you don't know about it. And then, you know, you, you need to be a student all over again, time and time again. Um, and people, they they can't stay consistent because right away they're like, oh, that's it. I eat that burger. I'm the most horrible person in the world. I don't deserve to be healthy. That's it. I'm done. Oh, that's it. I got tapped out. There are those moments, you know, mm-hmm. where I passed out. That's worse. I haven't been there, but it's worse. <laughs> I tapped out or I passed out and I'm not going back because the young kids, that's what's happening to the middle-aged people, right? The young kids, they're just too fast. I can't be dealing with that environment anymore. I can't train there anymore. Like they don't believe in themselves. They don't understand, right? And then you're like, am I really seeing this like the wrong way? Or like, to me, it's clear that we just need to love ourselves a little more, right? 
and change okay. change the expectation. You talked, you mentioned watching yeah. seventy year olds play in a hoda. You know, no, they're not going to be pulling backflips. They're not going to have the most dynamic aesthetic movement, but they can still understand the game. They can still get better, and they can still enjoy it and better themselves. Exactly. So it's you need to enjoy where you're at with what you have, right? And then as you go, you learn more tools and then growth can happen in that space. And I think the physical growth also comes from a lot of psychological and mental growth, right? So if you're doing, oh, like right now, you can't see it. I have a knee injury right now. I just hurt my knee last Friday, right? And I don't know what it is yet. I really don't know. I have no idea. Right now, I'm just babying and telling that I love you. I love you. I love you, knee. Please get better for me. That's where we're at right now. But... There's so many things that I can still learn that are outside from the physical body and I can still do the physical body stuff. Yesterday, I isolated my knee and I did a lift. I just did it sitting down. And that's pe- people, things people don't realize that can do. In Capoeira specifically, music, music takes mm-hmm. forever to learn. Mm-hmm. Music is difficult. Just Not holding just- a beer and bow is a nightmare. <laughs> exactly. But then let's think of the other level, okay? Holding the beating bow is a nightmare. But let's say you graduated from holding the beating bow and you've graduated from, you know how to play it really well, you keep up in a hoda. Singing. Mm, singing is right, difficult. Right. Oh, let's say you know how to sing. Ah, now let's look at the perspective of singing from someone who's been in capoeira. Singing is literally the control of the energy in the hoda. The emotion that you put through to your voice will make the game happen. I can make you excited. I can make you get beat up. I can make a ton of things happen. You know that. Yeah. You know that. You've been in Capoeira. Yeah. You know? I just like the way you said it. It's hilarious, but it's amazing, right? I conduct the flow of energy in the harder. Right. So if me, during my singing, I'm stiff because it's hard to control your voice, right? Because the instruments in Capoeira, the reason why they're difficult to sing with is because they cross the... <laughs> <laughs> they, they they don't flow with the melody you mm-hmm. know like the beating bow will be like this and then your voice has to do the complete opposite but you're still meeting some at some point in time so usually the percussion instruments are the first ones that people get into because the beating bow yeah man because the beating bow is, is difficult and then emotion emotion into your singing being there being outside of the hall does work did you know that Mm-hmm. Being a spectator. Why? Because you're you're contributing your energy, and just just by observing it, your energy is involved. Yes, exactly. That's exactly it. And people don't realize that it's like a chain reaction, right? It's the singer, it's the instrument. And because I spent so much time in the in Abu Dhabi, I had to drive an hour and I have to go see Mashti Kashir. Mm-hmm. I was the pioneer of capoeira in RA. It was they didn't have capoeira. And being a woman, thank you. I'm proud of that because I was afraid to start because I didn't want to leave the students like I was left. But I started it and another match day, a friend of mine picked it up. So it's still alive. I know. And that's just such a gift to just plant a seed and have people build community around that, you know. And when I I lived so long there and, you know, with the prayer starts, you have to stop playing. The mm, prayer starts yep, yep. in the prayer. It's a Muslim country. The prayer is numerous, ta- numerous times a day. And being in this environment, I started understanding um, and having true appreciation for being in a hoda where the people know how to play their instruments and where the people know how to conduct the energy. You know what I mean? It's just, it's magic when you're there and you're like, wow, this energy is great. Because I spent a lot of time having to learn how to produce that energy. And I did it. I realized when I started teaching that I didn't know how, right? And now I know how to produce it, but there's so much more I can do. Whenever I meet people that are higher than me at events, I'm like, wow, I really need to go home and play my instruments. (laughs) I love it. Yeah. So if people want to learn more about what you offer with your your programming, your, your coaching, teaching, Oh, you did ask All me where above. I teach. Sorry, you asked me yeah. a couple of times. Yeah, that's um, okay. Well, I want to make I want to make sure that people know how they can connect with you. So, website, social media, email, any of that you want to share? Sure. 
So as of now, because I just got into where I am, I am producing my online program, but you can find me at www.rootedstrengthmethod.com. I have an IG with the same name, but then my personal IG that's open is Morena Capoeira BJJ. And then I have, yeah, I have um, a YouTube channel as well. And I'm trying right now. It's me learning how to organize these things to make it happen because I'm running after keeping people in the game. That's what I want. But um, so hopefully we will have a summer launch for the program. Nice. We're nice. Hoping when, for a summer launch. When, when that hits, you know, send me, send me the link and we'll update the show notes with it. For sure. For sure. Awesome. This has been great. This has been a lot of fun and, and, I appreciate your your openness and your willingness to step into all of these different places again openly and yet bring them back together because for for me it's the combination of these things it's understanding that they all interrelate it's the energy it's the music it's the training it's the shedding of past whatever that makes it all so valuable and that's why I love martial arts Agreed. So now we're going to fade out. I'm going to record an outro in a little while. Mm -hmm. This is your opportunity to speak kind of for the last time, but directly to the audience. We've got a bunch of people listening from all different backgrounds all around the world. What do you want to tell them? Hmm. Don't be afraid of the struggle. It is difficult, but that's the spot where the most beautiful flowers bloom. Like, that's it for us. That's it. Um, and believe in your power because you're the only human in the world to be wearing your skin. No one is like you. You are only, you are magical. You are amazing. And you don't need to be like anyone else. And that's just perfect. And that's where power is. That's all I got. <laughs> there are episodes of this show that just hit me different for whatever reason. And I've spent some time thinking about why this one was one of those. And I'll be honest, I can't articulate it yet. But it's one that here we are a week after I recorded it, and it's still sitting with me. I suspect for some of you, you're also feeling something similar. That there's there's something that came out of this episode that really meant something. And for that, I want to thank Morena because it was her openness and her willingness to go to these places that we needed to go that led to such a wonderful episode. So thank you. Uh, I'm sure we'll connect at some point. We're not that far away from each other. Listeners, or perhaps viewers, check out everything that we've got going on at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com from the show notes to the photos to the links you want to go deeper on this episode if you want to check out other episodes that's the place you can go if you're up for supporting us and the work that we do you have choices you might share an episode or leave a review or tell a friend or contribute to our patreon you know i'd love to visit your school for a seminar if you're up for having me just let me know we'll we'll make it happen i love doing seminars use the code podcast15 to save 15% off a shirt or gear or anything else at whistlekick.com if you've got suggestions for guests or topics or other feedback, I want to hear about it. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Whistlekick social media is at whistlekick. That brings us to the end. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.